Welcome back to Expert Instruction, the Teach by Design podcast where we dive deeper into the research surrounding student behavior by talking with the people implementing these practices, where they work, and with the students they support. I'm Megan Cave. I said it just now, but I'm going to say it again, you guys. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm so glad that I'm here to do another season of Expert Instruction. We're in the last few days of summer vacation, actually, over here. Our school year hasn't started yet. It starts for most of us out here in Oregon the first full week of September. So right now, in this moment, we're all desperately trying to just soak up as much sunshine as we can the last few moments of summer before the kids come back to school. But also, we're we're kind of alternating back and forth between looking for relaxation while we also coordinate with each other, schedule and plan and do all of the prep that we need to do to get ready for this school year. I'd be lying to you guys if I said that that work of preparing for the school year hasn't felt a little bit like a slog. Like it's been hard for me to gather up that motivation that I need to get going and feel energized and excited about what's coming. So I thought that this might be a great time to actually explore how it is that we can all think about that motivation and purpose behind our work. This month over on Teach by Design and now today in this podcast, we're exploring the role that purpose plays in our work. Specifically, we'll, uh, we're talking about the benefits of literally writing down your purpose statement, defining why it is that you do the work that you do every day, like really writing that down. And then how your school can go about the work of drafting a school-wide purpose statement, which is just a tiny bit different than your own personal purpose statement. So today, we really wanted to talk to someone who has done the business of crafting a vision, mission, and purpose statement with school teams. We invited Dr. Nicole Holland-Sims to join us in conversation today. She, Nicole, is a technical assistance coordinator for the PBIS, Midwest PBIS Network. She's a certified school psychologist, and she's worked with caregivers of children of incarcerated parents, talking with them about how they'd like to engage in family school partnerships. She received the 2021 American Psychology Association Anti-Racism School Psychology Emerging Professional Award, and she was named the 2021 Pennsylvania School Psychologist of the Year. The whole year, Nicole was it. So yeah, we're pretty lucky. (laughs) She came to talk to us today and share some knowledge. The way that she talks about mission, vision, and purpose, and how those three statements can work together makes the work of creating them feel real doable. Like we we can do this, you guys. And Nicole's going to tell us all about it. She has this story about how she actually co-created, worked through the process of co-creating a purpose statement with the district leadership team. Um, that was really focused on some equity and inclusion work, which if we can just pause for a second and think about what that would mean to co-create a purpose statement, one statement that everyone can get behind and align with to define the purpose of the work that they were about to embark on related to equity and inclusion, that could sound like a real daunting task. (laughs) Could sound real hard to do. But the way that she talks about it, their process sounds pretty fun, actually, and inspiring and something that maybe we all could do on any team that we're a part of. Ultimately, what they ended up with was a strong unifying theme, and it helped to create what she calls the coalition of the willing. We're all lucky, like I said, to learn from Nicole. So grab whatever it is that you need to grab to take some notes, get comfortable, settle in and check out what she's got to say. Nicole, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me today on our podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Oh, good, good. Me too. Me too. It's a good topic to talk about. Um, So this, this month, we're really focused on purpose. And the reason that Um, that we chose it as a topic was, I've been, I don't know, you may have been experiencing this too, but as I've been following along with what people are talking about on social media, what my friends are talking about, what colleagues are talking about, everyone, first of all, is shocked that it is August. Right. 
second, they are they're still kind of um, recovering from the past year and maybe like the past couple of years that they've experienced in classrooms. Um, and so they don't feel as refreshed and ready for the year, um, for this school year as they may have in years past. And so something that I've been really interested um, in learning more about is how to, what role purpose plays in the work that we do. And so I guess to start, something that might be useful is I think for me anyway, I think others too, um, I was most familiar with mission statements, like an organization has a mission statement and maybe they have a vision statement, but there's also now this third thing that we're talking about, which is a purpose statement. Right. And so I was curious, um, I think they all work together um, to really like communicate something about the place where we work, but I'm curious how you distinguish them in your mind. Yeah. So first off, I want to just stand in validation around, I can't believe it's August <laughs> and <laughs> that this summer has literally evaporated before our eyes. Totally. Yeah. And then how that must feel for the educators that oh. we have supported and continue to support and just not really getting a chance to decompress the way that I think they would need to. Yes. So when I think about all of those things that are kind of competing priorities for folks, and then to your question about these three big buckets uh -huh. that make the work live and breathe. So purpose, mission, and vision. For me, they've often been interchangeable. Mm -hmm. But when I think about what each one really represents, they can't necessarily be synonymous. So mm -hmm. for me, when I think of, of mission, for instance, that's the one that most of us are most familiar with. Definitely. When I think of the mission, I think of, okay, these are the things that I need to make sure I do on a consistent basis that reflects the goal of the work. Yes. So what are we ultimately seeking to accomplish? That then, for me, then leads to vision. Mm -hmm. So the vision is almost the North Star. What is the place that you want to get to? What is the thing that you want to hold on to and see happen as a result of you living your mission? Purpose drives that mission. So yeah. the purpose is what keeps me going, what makes me motivated, what makes me want to get up in the morning or want to resume being back to work after being off for what didn't feel like a long summer. <laughs> yeah. My why. Yeah. I know people have heard that a lot and they hear it consistently. What is your why? Remember your why? All of those mm -hmm. things. And I've heard people say, I don't want to hear that anymore. I know my why. But it's important to be clear on that and to be intentional about that. So what is driving you? Maybe it's not your why, but what is your drive? What makes you want to do the work that you do? And mm. I know for me, it's my four-year-old son. Mm. Prior to him, it was, I just wanted to see a better climate for students. I wanted students to walk away from their experience at school that I was a part of, feeling like they can. I contributed to that and they had a, a great future to come. Yeah. Each one of us is going to have a different why and a different reason, but that's yeah. how I see the three of them. I think that's so perfect. I see it really similarly to you. Um, and I also think that what's really great about what you were just saying is that our purpose can shift over time. And so it may be that we used to know why it was that we were doing the work, but maybe that reason doesn't resonate as much as a new purpose could. And so for you, it was like originally um, it was students and creating a better, a better um, community within the school. And now you've added to that, that you have a personal connection to why you're doing the work. So it's not that you've lost the original purpose. It's that original. And now you have this personal connection to it. And I think too, that, um, that when we think about mission and vision, we can think about having an organizational mission, an organizational vision. But I wonder if we've ever really talked about purpose as an organizational purpose, mm -hmm. that we can have our own personal purpose for what gets us up in the morning and going to work. But as far as like defining our organization's purpose, like what is our school's purpose? That to me feels 
different and, um, and maybe more challenging. And it could be that missing component for people that like, they know their why, but maybe they don't know their leadership's why Mm. they don't, they don't connect necessarily with, there's a mismatch potentially by not defining who or why you're doing the business of education as a school. Um, you are not giving anyone a connection to their personal purpose. Does that make sense? It does. It really does. And so I can reflect on the work that I most recently did for our department of education. And we're in the process, we were in the process of developing a roadmap for equity, inclusion, and belonging. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we, we decided was important was not just to create this roadmap and hand it to the field, but we had to start with an authentic why. Yeah. And with that authentic why, to your point, which I I love that you brought this out, each one of us is going to have a different why. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so we had to come together over a month's time. We met every Tuesday as a collective Mm -hmm. and we started with our own personal whys. Mm -hmm. Then we got small breakout rooms and we talked about our whys and tried to come to an agreement amongst the two of us. And then we brought in groups of four and (laughs) groups of six. And then finally we had three, I would say the best three whys as Mm -hmm. to why we needed this work done. And then we voted on the the three, which one did we most align to? And that building of community made what we then decided to build mean something to each person that we all could get behind. I love that concept of the collaborative why, uh, why making. (laughs) Yes, I do too. I do too. And it wasn't really something that I had thought all that much about until I started kind of exploring it as a topic for this month. And, um, and it turns out that like your process with your leadership team is very similar to the process that, um, that others can do in any organization that they're in. And so I really do think that it's possible for um, for schools to do this work um, and have a school-wide purpose that they can um, create, co-create with their larger community, with students and with staff and with families um, so that everybody can contribute to the reason why they think school is important and why they're coming and sending their kids to school, why kids are showing up at school and why staff are coming to teach. And so everybody can contribute to that in a way that, like you were saying, you're taking your personal reasons for being there and expanding them to the collective and finding that unifying theme so that everybody is coming and they know why the mm-hmm. school is happening in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so good. Um, so for me in my work, um, a mission has really served to, um, to put my work in a box. Um, it really focuses me and my attention. And instead of really paying attention to like ev- lots of different aspects and having them all come at me at once and being a little bit overwhelming, I can really say like that my work is focused on these things and that other people can, and it's not to say that anything else is not important. It's just that this is my work and this is how I'm contributing to this field, right? right. And so I have a vision, I have a mission And so for me, purpose has really served, well, listen, it's the external motivations don't happen all the time, right? Sometimes you don't get that that positive feedback from people. Sometimes you don't hear a thank you or an acknowledgement about the work that you do because it's the work that you do. It's just sort of this expectation that you're doing this work. And so being able to return to or or define why I'm doing this in the first place, it connects me to the greater good, to the bigger picture. And by knowing what my contribution is, it keeps me doing it because I start to think if I'm not doing this, who's going to do it? Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the role that purpose has played in my work, that I feel this um, this real motivation to do, to keep doing it because I, I don't know that if I wasn't doing it, who else would do it? And would they do it? You know, could they do a better job? Where would other people get the information? All of that kind of plays into it. What does it, what has it done for you and your work being able to have that defined purpose? Yeah. So I can definitely agree and understand that feeling of if I don't do it, who will? Mm -hmm. And 
also trying to not get trapped in that too, right? Because sometimes, yeah, so sometimes it can be overwhelming to think about. (laughs) Yeah, and I have to keep going, I gotta do it, yeah. Yeah, and so for your own wellness, it's how do you strike that balance or find that harmony Mm -hmm. and how to make sure that the purpose doesn't override you Ah, so much to the point that you you can't really remain focused and get burned out quickly. So I think it's important to find that harmony for me, that has been a journey and it's not easy No, because I, I'm pretty, pretty confident we are very similar <laughs> in how we're approaching the work of systems change, which is mm-hmm. big to big. begin with. So big. you have to have that kind of big want and yes. that big why and that big yes. purpose to yes. keep connected because not only are you trying to impact systems for students, but you're also looking to impact systems for adults too. Yeah your yeah. colleagues, the community at large, and that's daunting. Yeah. So being able to not only find the internal purpose that you have, but who are like-minded folks that mm. we can use in our, as we call coalition of the willing, the people that can be around you to support you and build that community around you. So yes. you're not the only person that has the voice. Um, I had to learn that. I what was definitely, point. yeah, I was definitely in that space of, if not me, who, and no one can do it better than me. I, I live kind of that. Fair. Fair. <laughs> and I, had, Listen, I don't know you that well, but I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to just drop that ego a little bit and say, yeah. Nicole, there are other people that are just as passionate as you. And why not leverage that? You don't have to bear the brunt all the time. And so as I think about what drives me, mm-hmm. it's shifted. So mm-hmm. early in my career, it was about me. It's now shifted to how do I empower others to be their best selves in line with me and in conjunction with me rather than me trying to own it all. Yeah. Yeah. It's that unify, it's that unifying theme. Yeah. You together as a group. Like this is what we're doing together. Exactly. I like that. I like that a lot. Um when we, when I first reached out to you, you had talked about um the way that this um had come up in your um, work with districts, I think around um, equity. Mm-hmm. Can you um, can you just talk a little bit more about the way that this has come up um, within those conversations and how these statements might be so important to that work? Yeah, so I think most recently what I found with school districts in Pennsylvania and I'm sure otherwise is this need to come back to mission and vision. Mm-hmm. Um, what we were finding in a lot of our school districts is they were facing opposition about certain things that they were putting in place, whether it was social emotional learning or thinking that doing equity work meant we were now indoctrinating students or anything like that that has become hot button topics yes. societally. Yes. Our districts were really facing a lot of questions that they didn't really feel prepared to answer because they felt like, well, we're trying to do what's right for kids, right? That was their their immediate response. And I often would say, let's look over your mission and vision statement. Mm -hmm. And when they would look at it, it would say things like creating excellence in education or preparing uh, self-directed citizens. You know, they had those types of terms. And I would say, read it again (laughs) and read it again. Uh Are you doing those things and what you're offering the students, the communities, the families? Yes, we are. Then always anchor yourselves back in that mission and vision when you're facing questions like this. Yeah. Because often, if you've been able to co-construct those missions and visions, most people in your community are going to agree with it and back you Mm -hmm. in what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. If you haven't done that activity uh, of yes. co-construction, then mm-hmm. maybe that's something you need to consider. Mm-hmm. And that might be why you're facing some of this backlash or some of these questions you don't feel prepared to answer. It's hard to gauge what it might be, but at least having something you can always anchor yourself in and circle back to mm-hmm. is what the mission and vision should be. Mm-hmm. And so I always kind of reorient them. And it was surprising to even hear one superintendent say, you know, I don't, I'm a newer superintendent and I don't know that I know our mission and vision because it was put in place years and years ago. And Mm -hmm. he's like, 
we need to get a team together and revisit because it may not be appropriate anymore. Yeah, maybe it's changed. Maybe exactly. it's changed. I do think that this, that all of these things, mission, vision, purpose, all of that should be things that you come back to all the time. Right. You have to revisit them because you change as a person, your school changes. There's just like, there's change happening all around us all the time. And so I think going back and just reading it, and like you said, reading it again and one more time, you know, is, is really important so that you, everybody not only knows it, but um, everyone has the opportunity to say, is that still true? And yes. do we want it to be true? And we're just not, we're not meeting that mission anymore. Or is the mission, it does the mission itself need to be revised? Exactly. And yeah. I think too, making sure that it's not just a check box. Oh, we did the mission statement. We're done. Done. But how does that hold us accountable, you know, that we're going to actually try to execute this mission and vision and purpose uh -huh. as well? Yeah, yeah. I think that those, all of those statements, I kind of think about it sometimes when I was a kid, my mom would, um, I wouldn't want to do something or whatever. I'd, someone would invite me somewhere and I was like, I don't really want to, but I don't want to be the one to tell my friend that I don't want to go. You know, my mom would be like, well, just tell them I said you can go, you know? And I think in some ways, these statements can serve that purpose for us also, you know, that we can be like, we're making this decision because we have this commitment. And so we just, if we tie everything back to it, it's all going to be fine. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> it's one small yeah. strategy. To one way. Be fine. <laughs> it's one way, but it yeah. at least gives you um, intention. Yeah. Yeah. Keyword. Um, so you would, you mentioned as you were talking about co-creating these statements. And so I'm curious to know what are some of the ways that you've seen districts, leadership teams, school teams, uh, go about the work of co-creating these statements with their community? Yeah. So I think what's interesting is that every district that I've supported has been unique in its own way, which is the awesome part of this. That's work, great. Right? That's so You're great. There. There's no one way to do it. Right. But you start to pick up little patterns of things that work. And so what I've noticed is being able to go to meet families and communities where they are. Mm -hmm. And when I say meet them where they are, I don't mean like, you know, connect mentally or what have you, <laughs> but actually physically <laughs> going <laughs> to the places that they are. So if it's a church, if it's a community center, if it's things like that, so that they feel comfortable being with folks that represent school. Not everyone had a great experience as a student. So even walking through the doors of a building can be off-putting or scary, um, and it may reduce their willingness to participate. So that's one way that I've seen districts operate is to go yeah. to a centralized- Get on their turf, yeah. Yeah, and really outline what it is they're looking for and what the ask is, not so much, we're here to tell you about X, Y, and Z, but rather we wanna hear from you. So I'm here to listen. Yes. And so that's one other way that I've seen uh, that type of collaboration work is to present it as a listening session. Uh -huh. And that's one of the strategies that I've recommended to a number of districts, especially when things are a little contentious in the community. Mm -hmm. Like if there's been an incident or something that they need to restore some of the, the peace rather um, that would make the system work better mm -hmm. is let's just hear each other out. And so these could be asking outside community members that represent different organizations that are partnered with the school to facilitate some of these so that superintendents, teachers, counselors, while good at what they do with listening, just may not be able to take it all in because it might be personal without them recognizing it. Um, so being able to put your defenses down by having an outside facilitator can be really, really helpful. And then having facilitated questions, not a free for all where people can just come and dump and say, I don't like this and I don't like that, but rather, you know, what are two things we could do better as a system mm -hmm. and have them, you know, say what they think and someone's capturing those notes. Um, so that has been really helpful. Now for co-constructing, it's going outside of your typical families that you engage with and ensuring that it's not the same voices each time that are a part of these processes at school. It's easier to get the parents and families that are always coming to us or want to, to volunteer, but then we may be missing some voices that are really important. Yeah. So I think that's also critical. And that may be going to teachers and saying, which students, which families are we not hearing from in your classroom and making a concerted effort to reach out. 
and inviting them to that space and say, we wanna create a new mission, vision, purpose for XY school district or XY building. We would love your input. That might be the first time they've ever had an invitation like that. So taking those risks are pretty important. No kidding. It makes people feel like they're actually a part of something. And exactly. I would say, I would say too, that when people make those that ask as a parent that's been asked to take surveys or participate yep. in conversations, it's, I'll answer the questions and then I'll never hear what happened with that. I don't get like, what were, what were the responses? Like, what did you hear from people? What, what's the summarized version of this uh, this survey that we all took, mm -hmm. um, how are you going to implement the feedback that you got from us? So not even like, don't just end with asking people for their input. If you want to provide them with a feeling that what they're saying is valuable, it's that like connecting it back at the end, like you get their feedback and then you reach out again and you tell them what you're doing with it or the yeah. results of what of their responses, that kind of thing. I think it just reaffirms for people that they're actually a part of the process and that you're actually taking what they say seriously. Absolutely. It's not lip service. And it means a lot to know that what I said had some use. Yes. Even if it wasn't exactly what I said, but you at least heard a part of what I said, it means that I have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. And that feedback loop, we want it as adults at yes. work. <laughs> so yes. the same can be said about families and communities and, and their partnership with us as schools. I'll say too, um, that recently, like last week, um, we just came out with a survey called the Feedback and Input Survey that people Ooh. can take. And so if people are looking for um, a, uh, a more formal way of collecting feedback from like as many people as you want, there's a survey for students, there's a survey for staff, there's a survey for families. Um, and it's a place, there's open fields for people to just type in what they, what they want to say um, without having to just select never, sometimes, always as their options, you know? Um, so I do think that there are some more formal ways of getting that feedback too. Um, but I really love, I've always loved those informal sort of just conversational, get a group together and someone take notes, um, record them, whatever it is that you can do just to get that real interaction, um, I think, between the people that are that are doing the creating and the people that are going to be impacted by it. Um, I think both of those ways of getting that input from people um, can be really useful. Yeah, it's the old mixed methods, right? <laughs> yeah. <That's important. laughs> I mean, we talk so much. I, I don't know. Listen, we come from a place over here where data is our friend and we often talk about things in terms of numbers and quantifying mm -hmm. things. But I also come from a journalist background where actually having conversations with people is so rich. And, um, and for me, like creates a deeper connection between me and the person that I'm talking to than a survey ever could. So yeah, mixed method is like, it's the business. It's like, it's great. Okay, you just made a new hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think we're kind of at a place though where people who are listening are like, yeah, yeah, this is great. I'm still not sure how this year is gonna go. And I'm having a hard time motivating myself to get into the classroom and to start this whole year all over again. So what would you say to people that are in that place? Like, I don't wanna talk about my why, I just need the energy to get into the classroom and I want this year to go better than last year. So I think if I had any words of advice, it would be to name that, <laughs> don't push it under the rug. Don't try to push yourself when you know you're not feeling feeling it, for lack of a better term. Um, you have to name it and you have to be honest about how you're feeling yeah. because that's the only way that you'll begin to start to unravel what you could potentially do as a next step to motivate yourself. So one of the things that I do, so this is my like self-help advice. Yeah, do it. Relief. What do you have? Um, I'm taking a note. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> so at the top of the new year, you know, you're on social media and people throw out different little strategies. And yeah. one of the things that I picked up was this concept of every week, think of three things for the week ahead that you're looking forward to. Mm. 
-hmm. And then at the close of that week, reflect on what went well. So the Mm -hmm. things you were looking forward to, what went well, and then be honest, and this is a journaling activity, be honest about what didn't go well and what you may have tried differently. Mm -hmm. So that has been helpful for me. And I literally, I didn't know if I would keep up with it, but it (laughs) actually made me look forward to doing that Mm -hmm. every every Sunday, like, okay, the The ritual is this, Mm -hmm. and these are the three things that are positive that will potentially bring me joy. Mm-hmm. that I can focus on when everything else feels like it's burning. Yeah. So just being kind of, again, honest about how you're feeling, knowing that it's okay mm-hmm. to feel the way that you do. Yes. And I know it's hard to hear that sometimes because as educators, we're always, we got our, our educator hat on, we yeah. got our armor ready and we're ready to go. Yeah. But that's the expectation, right? That you show up and you are the person. Like That's right kids are coming into your classroom and they have an expectation families when you see them they have an expectation and so it can feel like I gotta be this way you know I gotta put on this this mask Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that mask can get old (laughs) right it's stinky yeah after a while that mask has to come down yes and you have to be authentically you yes and that's not easy but it it will take time, but if you do those little strategies to just remind yourself of who you are and what you want to see happen each week, small bites, the yeah. year's too big to think about. So some of us it's daily. Yeah. And it's okay. Like I just want to validate that it's okay to feel the way that you do, but think yeah. of a strategy that would work for you to keep you going. I would affirm for every, anyone who's listening that is having a hard time getting going this school year. I want to just affirm for you that you aren't alone because yeah. I have felt that way this year. Okay. I have felt like I just ended this, like what felt like a sprint to the finish. And then I got like four seconds of breathing time. And now I'm like getting back to the starting line again to do it again. And it's overwhelming for me. And so I just want everyone to know that like, like you were saying, it's, it's important just to recognize but also to share in places that you feel safe to share that how you're feeling, because odds are high that even if someone doesn't feel exactly the same way you do, they either have felt that way and have some ideas for how they can be helpful or at least listen, or there's some part of what you're saying that they, they feel too, that they can empathize with. And so, yeah, I think it's just, it's just about being truthful with what you're feeling um, and doing what you can to get yourself where you, where you can be useful to other people in your work. For me, that the exercise that I went through this month of defining my purpose for this space, this podcast space and our blog space was incredibly useful um, because it reaffirmed for me why I started these things in the first place. I had kind of forgotten. And, uh, and so now I have it taped to my desk and it's, a, it's something that I can actually see every day. Um, and if you don't know where to start with defining your why for things, um, one strategy that I have found to be incredibly useful is called the five whys. And uh, all you do is you take a statement about what it is that you're doing and you ask yourself, why are you doing that thing? And then you ask it again, and then you ask it again. And so you go through it and you ask yourself why five times. And by the time you get to the fifth response to that last why, you have a really solid understanding of why you're doing that initial task in the first place. Love it. So I ask myself, Uh, let's see. So for example, okay, so we're talking here on this podcast, right? And, um, we're talking about purpose today. Why are we talking about purpose? Well, I think it's because our decisions, the decisions that we make should tie back to that purpose. Why? So that's our second why. Why? Well, it's to give our decisions meaning. Hmm. Why do our decisions have to have meaning? So that's our third why. So we know that we're intentional in our work. And so the fourth why, why do we need to be intentional in our work? To make sure that our work is equitable and valuable to the communities that we serve. And the last why is why does that matter? And so it's because everyone in our community deserves a place to learn where they can be 
exactly who they are enthusiastically. And that becomes the purpose for why we're here even talking today. Yes. Because the people that we serve and the people that are listening deserve to know what they can do to be supportive of themselves and each other to be exactly who they are in the work that they're doing. So if you just ask yourself why five times and you write down your answers, by the time you get to that fifth why, you'll find some nugget that can become a purpose statement for the thing that you're about to do, even if it's something small. And it doesn't take that long to do that exercise. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah. It makes me think of what I described at the top with how we brought all those people together, yes. co-constructed and did why, 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 why? Exactly. That is that personal mm -hmm. activity Mm -hmm. that I think really gets to the root and mm -hmm. the, the core of yes. why you're doing what you do. I love yes. that. That is awesome. And you can I'm do it as it. a group. Yes, you should. And you can do it as a group too. You can ask yourselves as a team, like, why are we looking at our behavior data in the first place? Yep. And you go through the exercise of defining it so that at the beginning of the school year, before you even look at your first set of referral data, you sit down and you talk as a team about why you're doing that work in the first place. And so then every time someone shows a graph on, about a referral or about like where the behaviors are happening or uh, an intervention that you've got going on, everybody knows that when you show that there's a reason for it. And we can all point back to what that reason was because we all agreed on it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nicole, what's coming up for you in your work? What are you up to? Uh, a lot of exciting, fun things. So I am recently starting a new role, and that is going to be as technical assistance coordinator for the Midwest PBIS network. Yay! Congratulations. Super excited yeah. about that. And then the second part of that journey is I'm looking to launch my own business called Holland Sims Consultation. So I'll be able to support not only educational spaces, but organizations at large nice. in doing systems change. So just really excited for these two tremendous opportunities. And PBIS, my husband told me, he's like, you're happiest when you do PBIS. <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> so I'm excited to, to really uh, jump in with both feet with Midwest uh, PBIS Network. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's like big life stuff happening all at once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I need my why. So you gave me my strategies. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was awesome. Mm -hmm.